folks are f still filling in, but i um, really happy to bring to the stage Crystal Hickman. Crystal is a TEDx speaker, artist, community scientist, and photographer based in Los Angeles, California. And through artful photography, Crystal strives to increase awareness in the decline in native bee species, as well as highlight their biodiverse systems. So please join me in welcoming Crystal. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome, yeah. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a really nice introduction. Um, so yeah, just to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an artist. I'm obviously a photographer. I'm not just photographing the ground there. There's actually a bee under there. Um, also, I am a speaker as well, which you can tell today. And regarding my photography, what I photograph are native bees also the plants they visit, as well as their ecosystems. Primarily, I photograph in California, but if you look at the photo in the lower right-hand corner, I also visit some other countries. So one thing I really want to say that's great about the California Native Plant Society Conference is this is the first time I haven't had to explain to people what community science is. <laughs> and I just, I think it's amazing because this used to be called citizen science, but language is just evolving at such a fast rate. The meaning behind it, it changes before the definitions do. So I think it's really great that this conference is not just being aware of that, not just acknowledging it, but also changing the language to make people feel more included. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yes, I'm a community scientist. I specialize in militology, which is the study of bees. So what I primarily do is photograph bees in their environments. I document their behavior also notate the plants that they're on, and keep track of things like times, dates, and weather that they're present. Actually, every location that I visit, I keep an Excel sheet. I update it every year and just see what changes from year to year. So how I got started, I don't know if anyone's seen this quote before. Uh, if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. Has anyone seen this before? Yeah, okay, and how many people know it's not true? <laughs> okay. I didn't when I first read it, but it got me started, and I thought, hey, Einstein said this. This is, this is a great quote, and uh, he didn't say it because he wasn't alive in the 1990s when this was made up, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it is outside his field as well, yes. <laughs> um, so I read it, and I believed it was true. I also believed it was about honeybees, so I had my phone, so I went out and just took so many pictures of just honeybees like just honeybees. And then I took this photo, and it's clearly a bee, but it's not a honeybee, and I had absolutely no idea what it was. So I ended up going back to the people who I thought at the time were bee experts, which were beekeepers, and asked them what kind of bee is this. They didn't know. And of all places, I turned to Facebook, um, and there was a group there that was dedicated to native bees, which was a term I'd never heard before. And the group was full of people called militologists, who are people who study bees. And they told me right away that this was a female Andrina, and she was a native bee. And then it was actually native bees, not honeybees, that were threatened or endangered. So this kind of completely changed what I was doing. I ended up going back to all the places I'd gone before to photograph the honeybees, and for some reason, I wasn't finding any native bees and had absolutely no idea why. And that was until the Crescent Farm, which is a one-acre native garden at the LA Arboretum, they actually posted photos of about four or five species of native bees they'd seen in one day. And I was like, okay, this is weird. I've been looking around for months. Why are there so many here? And I went. First day I was there, I took these photos. And after talking to the horticulturalist John there, I found out that there is a relationship between native bees and native plants. So save the native bees also means save the native plants. Also want to get into some differences between honeybees and native bees, because I know there's a lot of confusion. So first off, honeybees are not threatened or endangered. Native bees are potentially threatened or endangered. Honeybees, the ones that are in the US, are from Europe. Native bees are from where they currently reside. So just like native plants, they could be native to all of the United States, they could be native to just California, or even your zip code. 
so honeybees, you, um, you can actually put water out for them. They drink water sources provided by people. Native bees get their hydration from plants, so you don't need to put water out for them. Honeybees are generalist pollinators, meaning they'll try and pollinate everything, but they actually don't pollinate anything all that well. They have about a 5% pollination rate. Um, native bees can also be generalist pollinators, but they can also be specialist pollinators, meaning they just pollinate one family of plants, potentially. Honeybees are also detrimental to native bees. They've been known to spread diseases to bumblebees. They also outcompete bees, uh, native bees for resources. Uh, native bees are threatened by climate change, which I'll get into in a second. Honeybees live in colonies. Uh, native bees, 70% are ground nesting, 30% are cavity nesting, and about 90% are solitary. So I want to get into specialist pollinators. Uh, this bee is really cool. This was my first specialist pollinator, and I saw this is the male and the female on the side of the road when I was driving through Death Valley, which, you know, is regular thing to do. Um, but what's really cool about this was uh, this is one of my first contributions to community science because the male, if you notice, he's in the lower right hand corner there. He kind of looks like he has a duck face. Um, Militologists have been studying this bee for about 100 years and they never knew what that feature was for. And the way a lot of scientists study bees, they actually put out traps and they just collect dead specimens. But I was looking at these species alive, so within 10 minutes of actually finding this bee, I photographed them using the facial feature. So this is what people can do if they just go out with a camera. So the male's actually trapping the female there, trying to mate with her. Um, so it's a really positive facial feature. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, one other thing that's really cool about um, this, fl this plant is I, I noticed everything on it was the same color of yellow, so you could just tell like everything evolved together there. I think it was really cool. And then another thing about specialist pollinators, if a lot of times if you want to look for the pollinator, you look for the plant. So this bee is an example of that. This is the smallest known bee in North America. It's potentially the smallest bee in the world. And I photographed this bee on a neighborhood in Antelope Valley in Southern California. It's called a Perdita minima. And if you look at the quarter in the lower right-hand corner, the flower's on it, so you can tell how small this bee is. And another bee that I actually saw there as well that's equally, well, not as small, but pretty small. Um, this is a Lassia glossum dialectus, and it's known as a bee that no one can ID to species. But because of cameras evolving, I was actually able to get an ID on this one. And she's only about three millimeters long. So again, with changing technology, I think people can make contributions. And another thing I want to point out about the sand mat, it was only about two feet by two feet but all of these creatures lived on it. So ecosystems can be very small. And one really cool creature that was on this sand mat is the one in the center. So this is a mite with no common name, otherwise I'd use it, but it's called a Paratarsotomus macropalpus. And it's about 1.5 to 1.7 millimeters. It's the fastest land animal on Earth relative to its size. <laughs> so yeah, if it was the size of a person, it'd run about 1,300 miles an hour, opposed to like a cheetah, which runs about 60. So what can we do? We can do a lot of things, but two things that I think everyone can do are document to raise awareness and also plant native plants in our yards. So a great app I recommend everyone have, I'm pretty sure a lot of people have it already, but iNaturalist, I see people taking their phones out when they're hiking. You can take your phone out, take pictures of something. Um, I ID things for people. There's a lot of uh, great scientists on this app. It also brings me back to um, a garden in Pasadena called Arlington Garden. So this is another great example of community science. So I thought this bee, which is a Xylocopa sonorina, I thought it hadn't been present at the garden since 2018. But because I started doing nature walks and bio blitzes, people saw the bee in 2021, and there's actually a pretty good population there. But this is an example of what happens if there's only one person out there looking. They might miss things. So the more people that can get involved in community science, the more they can contribute. Um, also doing a lot of things in the Santa Monica Mountains. And Santa Monica Mountains is beautiful. It's brown a lot of the parts of the year now because of climate change and we're in the third year of a drought. And a lot of people have started moving to the mountains just because it's really beautiful, but because it's so dry too, they're also worried about fires, which are happening there. So they asked a conservancy to actually 
start bulldozing and going through with tractors to cut down areas. And one thing that I was really sad about with this location is I never took a before picture. So this was a location where I'd actually been going for about six and a half months last year, and I photographed 41 species of bees there. And after they went through with the tractors, I have not seen a single bee there since July, beginning of July last year. And they actually went through with the tractors again this year. So really sad. Um, what we can do is native landscaping. This is my friend Paloma's yard. I think her yard's a great example of what can happen in your yard, because she has this bee, which is a Perdita interrupta. It's a California poppy bee. It's a very rare bee. If you have California poppies and cryptantha, this bee might show up in your yard. So it collects pollen from the poppies and nectar from the cryptantha. Uh, not only does she have a rare bee, she also has an endangered bee. Uh, this is one of California's four endangered bees. It's a Queen Bombus crotchii. And then I know a lot of people know this already, but maintaining a native environment, um, you don't need pesticides or herbicides. Uh, a native landscape will naturally keep a healthy biodiverse ecosystem. Also, these things impact more than just their intended targets. So what if Paloma, for example, decided she didn't like those bees in her yard? Which, I don't know who would decide that. But um, So she put out pesticides. What happens to the plants they pollinate? Just the opposite direction, what if someone puts out herbicides? What happens to the insects? So. Um, this insect, I, I think, is really cool. I call it an indicator insect, because if you have it in your yard, it means you have a healthy, biodiverse ecosystem. But a lot of people might notice it's in their yard because it's really tiny. So there it is next to the quarter. There it is at Arlington Garden on one of the flowers. So this is an indicator insect because its life cycle relies on creatures that we consider pests, aphids. So what the female actually does is she'll do something called ovipositing, where she'll like poke a little egg inside the body of an aphid. The aphid swells up like a balloon, and it basically becomes a cocoon for the wasp. And then when the wasp is ready to close or exit the aphid, she has a little hole out the back, pops out. Um, this is another great indicator insect, uh, lacewing. Um, there's the egg, the larva, as well as the adult. And what's really cool, too, about all of these creatures is I actually photographed them all on the same patch of flowers. So again, ecosystems can be very, very small. And I wanted to just reach, uh, mention some of my goals to you. Um, one of my big goals is I want to photograph the four endangered bumblebees in California. Photographed one so far. I went to the Trinity Alps to try and photograph one that hasn't been seen since 2016, so it might be endangered. Didn't see it. Going to try again next year. And also, just very randomly, um, I was walking to lunch with a friend yesterday. There was a guy on the side of the road. He was handing out flyers saying, come to my garden. And he just casually mentioned, we have the western bumblebee here. And it took me like a few seconds to actually like clock that. I was like, wait, do you mean Bombus occidentalis? Which is, it's one of the four endangered bumblebees. So I'm coming back to his garden next year to photograph that one, because that's just, yeah. So if anyone happens to have Bombus succlei in their garden, just let me know. I will stop by. I don't care where you live. Um, also, I want to encourage more people to get into community science, because California is a biodiverse ecosystem. Um, it's a hot spot here. We have 1,643 species of native bees out of the 4,000 in the US. So I think it would be great if when people thought of bees, they thought of more than just honeybees. Um, also, I want to promote and create native landscaping bridges. So for example, with my friend Paloma's yard, what happens if she moves and the people who move in decide to just put down a green lawn? Where are those bees going to go? So encourage your neighbors to just maybe put like a small area of native plants in. So those bees just have, not just bees, but pollinators. They have a, places to visit, different options. Um, also, I'm working on a couple of books, but a coffee table book, which I'm hoping to have done next year. I'm also working on some bee flashcards, which you can actually see one of them in the lower left-hand corner. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm good. I have one minute. OK, great. Um, so I'm just going to show you guys some uh, photos, because I think these bees are cool. Um, this is a female diadacia by tuberculata. It's her first, year, uh, first day of life as an adult outside of her uh, burrow that she grew up in. 
And this photo I think is really cute. So this is a female that couldn't fit down her turret. So you see her little legs actually sticking out covered in pollen. So I just, I think it's really funny. Um, but she was actually sleeping and her little feet were like going like this. Um, so this bee is a Lassiaglossum symbriolicus, and this is the only photo of a living representative of this bee. Um, I photographed it last year. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I photographed this bee last year in uh, the Trinity Alps, so it was an intense hike, but it's also the only record of a specimen post-2000. And with community science, I'm actually making a lot of regular observations of the first living representative. So far, I have about 15 species documented. Um, I just think this photo's cute. Uh, so nothing really interesting there. Um, this one I took, I think, last month. So this is a Protandrina, and this is the first bee of this genus that was ever photographed in California. Um, so one really interesting thing about this is there is a key available, but none of the species line up with this one. So the way I'm documenting bees is just alive. So what if this could be a new species, it could be a documented one already, but there's really no way to know. I'm gonna go back next year and like wait around a few days, hopefully one dies in front of me and then I could <laughs> take it to a lab. I know that sounds bad, but. <laughs> um, this one is also really cool. So um, the Saga chlorella, it took me about two years to get this photo. And this was actually the location in the Santa Monica Mountains that was basically cut down with a tractor. And I, I got this photo two weeks before that happened. So I hope that she got to live out the rest of her life. And I know she was probably had a burrow somewhere around there. So hopefully her offspring had a place to live because um, just, I think it's really sad because it is happening in a lot of locations. I am looking for a lot of specific bees that were sighted maybe even like 10 years ago. I go to the locations. There's a neighborhood there now or like a university building. And I'm going to wrap up. Um, so this, because I want to give you time for questions. Okay. I want to see all the Last photo. Sorry. Uh, so this is really cool. So this is a diadacia bee. They sleep in globe mallows. So when the, um, the flowers close at night, they, uh, they go in them. But when they open up in the morning, they they come out. So they're time with the flowers. So it's really cute. But yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Hi. I love that you're doing, that you're really focusing on live and not having to have dead ones and, you know, evaluating them that way because that's the way I do my next so you're trying to do all live. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's the woman, yeah. Um, excuse me, when you talk to people, do you get um, kind of a, the attitude of like, oh, I hate bees, they sting? Yeah, yeah, that's that's normally the first thing I hear about bees is like, oh, how many times have you been stung? Or, um, but yeah, most native bees don't really sting people. Are you able to convey that to people and they believe you? I am, you? yeah. So a lot of times when I run, out to pe run into people out in the field, you can actually put your finger out in front of them. A lot of them will climb on. They're very, very, a lot of them are very calm. Um, but yeah, they don't normally want to sting you. Um, I guess in the front. Nerd question. You talk about your gear. <laughs> My how told how me do you I get these them. incredible um, pictures? Yeah, so I have a lot of gear. Um, I have I have a macro lens with two diopters. Uh, they're like magnifying glasses. I also have two Laowa lenses, so like a wide angle macro, so you can take pictures of tiny things, but also the background. I also have an ultra macro lens, which I used for the uh, Perdita Minima, which is the two millimeter B. So. Um, I do you have them on a DSLR. I use a crop sensor lens because I like to kind of blow things up. Yeah. Um, I guess in the third row. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm also an insect photographer, and I'm curious how you connect with the ent entomological community to find about out about these needs and what they're studying, so you can help contribute. So that's kind of missing in my practice. Yeah. So I guess it depends. The the militology community I find is very very friendly. Um, I actually started posting just initially on Instagram, but then, so I just started to like photograph bees, but then I didn't realize I was actually gonna be documenting climate change, and that kind of attracted a lot of people to me. So then I started reaching out to different universities and developing relationships with people there. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay, guess in the floor. I can hold it. <laughs> 
So as far as restoration, right, I work in restoration mm -hmm. and before I even got there, there was just a huge push on having um, beehives on site. Yeah. So there's probably scattered, you know, we have a pretty dense location of probably about 50 to 60 boxes. And then we have a bee sanctuary that doesn't focus on native bees at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about another 25 to 30 boxes. And we are an urban restoration site right in the middle of the city. We are a small 14 acres, hoping to extend to 48 acres. And That's I'm great. concerned. I'm really concerned at how these honeybees are possibly, I would assume, pushing out the natives. So I just, yeah, wanted yeah. to. Hear. So um, I don't know how much time I have, but um, the there's a lot of impact honeybees have. I would say, like, just an example. I went to Santa Rosa Island earlier this year, and some militologists actually went there and um, got rid of the honeybees and it caused the native bee population to just boom. And it's been found that when native bee, or when honeybees are close to bumblebees, so they have a disease they get from varroa mites called um, deformed wing virus, and some adult honeybees are carriers. They don't actually have it. So since they're generalist pollinators, they'll try and visit all of these flowers, specifically in urban areas where there's not a lot of diversity for like native bees to visit. So bumblebees will visit those same flowers. They'll actually take that pollen back to their colony and feed it to their babies, which is why we're seeing bumblebees with these tiny wings. Um, so I think honestly the, the best thing you can do really is just encourage people to not put hives out because um, honeybees, I found them in the middle of the desert. They normally visit like two miles away from their hives even. Um, so yeah, I think the best thing you can do is just not have honeybees. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been awesome.